I'm really, I'm really excited to be here today um, with, uh, with all of you. There's a couple of faces that I, I'm uh, meeting again after a while. And, uh, obviously, quite, quite some new faces around. Um, I'm excited not only because I'm uh, one of the organizers this time of uh, the workshop, but also because I think it's a, it's a unique context that we're having here. Um, IRAS is among the, the, the greatest conference in robotic worldwide. There's thousands of people coming from all around the world to share their research on robotics. And to have such a, a roster of uh, speakers uh, they, uh, speaking about robotic artworks, uh, their own project uh, or, uh, or their own collaboration with artists, I think is really exceptional um, to have that in, in such a uh, unique context So at IRAS. Uh, today. Um, I'm, I'm sure some of you get um, why this is, this is unique and changing a little bit in the way we're, uh, we're uh, dealing with our, um, our field of expertise. Um, but uh, I want to uh, share with you why I'm so excited about this workshop today and, and maybe by that uh, making you uh, be as excited as I am with uh, the, the following talks. So, uh, for me, it, it all starts after graduate studies. You know, in engineering, um, we're studying how to use calculation tables and do some um, uh, some structural analysis and then circuit design, those kind of stuff. And then you you get on the on the, on the market, start working for different kinds of company, applying exactly what you've learned or you get into um, a set design workshop. So that was my, my first job. I, I was working in a set design workshop for a couple of years after my graduate studies, uh, designing uh, the sets for uh, theater shows and circus. Worked with the uh, Soleil and other theater um, in, the, in around Canada. And so what I've learned over there is that, actually what I've learned before in, in my undergraduate studies were just a, a small part of uh, what we could do with uh, with our knowledge and how to apply it, and it also made me um, well forced me to understand another realm that I wasn't really uh, used to deal with the uh, the artistic uh, communities. I mean, I've been quite often to theater show and such, but now I had to deal in in the production uh, part of it, and it's completely different. Uh, um, well. At the time, I saw it as completely different from what I've learned before and another methodology that I needed to, to learn and get acquainted with. Uh, after a while being there, I wanted more. I wanted to get uh, deeper into, uh, into the art realm. So uh, I'm going to introduce a couple uh, of projects, just uh, uh, three of them that will make you understand a little bit uh, where uh, the, the topic of this workshop is coming from. So I've worked um, as, a, as a consultant for many uh, artists uh, around the world. One of those was uh, Lozano, uh, Raphael Lozano Emer, based in Montreal. And so <clears throat> this guy asked me, could you design a bellow? You know, just a kind of souffle, we call it in French. So a bellow, it, it's a mechanical, um, kind of basic uh, mechanical design. And so I, I took the contract, I designed the bellow, and then uh, I delivered it to him. We assembled it with what he had in mind for, for the artwork. And the first time I saw it, I must say that I was completely moved. I wasn't expecting a simple bellow mechanism to do something like that. So this artwork is called Last Breath. What it does is that you have a paper bag at the end of it. You ask someone that is about to die to breathe in the bag. And then you plug the bag onto the machine and the machine will simulate the respiration of a human being for eternity. So it's basically a, um, a sense of this human being that you're keeping with you in your living room or whatever you're, wherever you're installing this artwork uh, so as to remind you of this person. And it's going to keep breathing in the paper bag again and again and again. It's quite an intense uh, piece, I must say. Um, <clears throat> I've worked with uh, Grigory Chatonsky, also another uh, artist dealing with uh, interactive uh, artworks. 
And for this one, he asked me to uh, design a dolly, a dolly that could be um, controlled with uh, your thoughts. So if you're focused on something, the dolly would go forward. And if you're just relaxed, the little dolly would come back to you. Then again, when I went into the, the museum where the exhibit uh, happened, I saw that the whole piece was about having a, a really heavy iron door um, heading really uh, quickly to um, a, a fragile wall. And so people were wearing the, the helmet, the EGG, EEG helmet, and uh, by focusing on the door, they were hitting the wall again and again. Um, obviously, they, they knew that if they just relax, the door would come back to them and stop hitting the wall. Um, but it's kind of hard in this context with all the stress you're having and seeing what is going on in front of you to just keep relaxed and make the door come back to you. And what happened in this installation that I found quite um, curious was that people were actually having remorse because they were the one destroying the wall. So they were kind of destroying the installation. One last, um, one last artwork I want to introduce uh, to get a sense of where we're going with this, uh, this workshop is the La Mariée Remise à Nu par le Binaire. Um, so this artist, Natalia Petkova, came to me uh, a year ago, two years ago, uh, asking to design a mechanism that will uh, that would control the, the speaker, uh, the, a human speech mechanism. So basically a machine, an exoskeleton, that instead of helping you doing something, is taking control over your body and making you do things uh, that the machine wants. So you can imagine a computer being connected uh, to this exoskeleton, and then the exoskeleton controls the vocal folds, the tongue, uh, the jaw, all muscles that, that are linked to the speech mechanism so that it can produce uh, phonemes. Obviously, it's a low resolution uh, speaker. It can produce phonemes um, that the, the computer decides. Um, I got into this, I must say, because I was curious about the whole idea and I was wondering where it would go, uh, on, on what kind of uh, performance it would end up. Um, well. Part of it was actually a little bit painful for the, the performer. As you can see right now, she's uh, drying her tongue to put some uh, electrodes on it so that like, uh, um, some amps could go to her tongue to control the movement of her muscle. That's the only way we managed to control the tongue. Uh, there was no way to attach mechanically to the tongue uh, because it's too wet. So, but even though, even though it was a little painful, and it looks a little bit uh, painful, I guess, just looking at the video like that, she did performance um, in, in, uh, in many countries around the globe, and uh, the, the interpretation or the per perception of the people were always similar. They were uh, trustworthy of the machine. Just because of the way she's putting on the machine and taking the time to put it on and explaining what she's doing and calling the machine as an entity that she's going to collaborate with to do a performance. So all the, the, this, this frame around, the, uh, around the, the performance makes the people um, trust the machine and believe that it was maybe not that painful. So we did a little uh, uh, HRI paper on that, uh, on the interpretation of the, on the perception of the, the audience for the machine. So <clears throat> all this um, made me think about what are, what are the differences between the way, as engineers, we develop robots or we create robots, we design them, and the way that uh, artists uh, are doing it, or uh, the way that, um, that they're thinking about uh, robotics? <clears throat> I, I must say that the, the next slide are not like, um, um, they're just my interpretation of what is going on in both fields. I haven't done any uh, short full, uh, study on that. It's an insight of my perception on what is going on. Um, so as, as engineers, uh, we're looking more for technical challenge, uh, unexplained events, something that we can dig in, something that, uh, that presents a challenge. Uh, then we refine upon our understanding uh, of what is going on or the context of it by looking into our peers' work, literature, 
then we create a rigorous and specific methodology to assess this question, to try to find an answer to what is going on, find at least a way to answer it. Then we collect a lot of data about it, and we try to uh, get a grasp of what are the variables play and uh, their, their scope. We analyze the data, create a model. That's not always the, the way it works, but I mean, it's a general kind of uh, uh, methodology just to make the, the parallel. And so we infer a model from, from those data, and obviously we validate our models both from uh, new data set or taking new data and both from uh, our peers um, looking after, looking into our work and trying to reproduce it. So this is, let's say, a, a general methodology uh, when we're facing uh, an issue or a challenge. So if, if you imagine um, a given challenge, so let's say uh, you're, you're willing to give uh, talks all around the world, um, but obviously you don't have the time to be everywhere at the same time. Um, you, you need to make a schedule out of your own, your own time, obviously, but you would like to be uh, every place uh, at the same time. There's a lot already of telepresence robot around, and um, there is uh, also some holographic design that, uh, that exists to do that, but they lack the physical um, interaction, the real, uh, the real physical presence of the, of the speaker. So as most of you already know, one solution could be a, a gymnoid. So to create a clone of yourself, a robotic clone that would be able to give uh, a talk for you. Um, of course, there's a lot more to this project than what I just said, but uh, uh, hearing Ishiguro talk about it, it's uh, mostly the, the, the baseline behind it. He wanted ubiquity, or he wanted to be able to give talks, to send, send a robot to give talks for him, while people in the audience will still have a feel uh, of, uh, of his physical pre presence in the room. So we find a way to uh, fix this uh, physical challenge. Cut, cut the sound here. Um, now let's think that your desk, if it's like mine, is, uh, is a real mess. And there's a, a lot of stuff around uh, components, electrical components, uh, USB dongles are around uh, student exams, uh, stuff like that all, all around sitting on your desk. And you would like your desk to be smart. You would like your desk to maybe clean itself. And, uh, and while you're at it, you would like to have maybe a mouse and a keyboard that are more intelligent interface to what you're doing with uh, your smart device, computer, and such, uh, than just using a keyboard and, and a mouse. So the Zoid project is, uh, is partly about that. It's about having a swarm of little bots on your desk that are uh, helping you dealing with your, uh, your daily, uh, daily life task. Um, it's a nice solution. It's a neat solution. Um, I've tried them, and we built a couple of them in our lab, and they're working uh, just great. But uh, the reception on the social media, just as with the Jim, Jim and I uh, project, was not always as good. Having a swarm of little robots, of course, if you look in science fiction or uh, other inspiration like that, um, it can be a little bit scary. So the, the, the project we're doing, the, the design we're doing can be scary for the public, obviously. That's, that's something common, let's say, in robotics more and more with, uh, with AI. Um, but also ourselves as engineer um, uh, can be afraid of what we, we are building our design. If I, get, uh, if I get back to the project of the, the human speaker, um, I, I wanted to make sure that she was really willing to get into that because that's kind of a dangerous system. And, and, uh, and um, I was afraid of what I was building. I mean, knowing the power of the motor and everything, you know that you can arm uh, the person. And, and if we just stretch that a little bit, at some point, the robot them, themselves, if I may say that, uh, may be afraid also of how they will be received in, uh, in the community. Uh, if we're having all those apprehension on um, what they, they can do and, um, and how we misunderstand what, what are their goals, um, they may themselves be a little afraid. Now, if I get on the, on the other side, well, maybe not the other side, but another point of view, 
and again, I, I'm not an artist here, so I'm really showing that uh, here in the room. I, I think that uh, as artists, uh, the, the, the methodology is more to look in what is uh, close to you, to what, what is surrounding you, what is around you, and how you feel about what is uh, surrounding you, than to question yourself as an artist, or themselves, to get a sense of how they're, they're perceiving what is going on and what, what is triggering those, and this, those emotions. Then they iterate, they do studies uh, on, uh, on different mediums to reproduce that, that emotion or to trigger this perception again. As with the engineer, more or less, they will share that artwork with an audience and uh, try to trigger that same perception or emotion they, they felt um, with, with their artwork. They will validate the, their own success or the success of the artwork with the feedback of the audience and with their, their peers' uh, feedback. Yeah. So if you apply that to, to robotics, you're having different kind of methodology, obviously, and so different kind of, of projects. Uh, I'll just go over two that are, uh, that are really um, speaking to me. Uh, obviously, there's thousands, and we're going to have quite a lot today um, that are going to be shared to us. Uh, one that I really like is RAP from uh, Lionel Moura. So he, Moura has been working since decades already on, um, on robots that are producing artwork, making their own artwork. Um, the difference with RAP, you're seeing the little robot on the right, the difference with RAP is that it's completely autonomous, there is no, um, there is no artist behind trying to program it. So it's going to look at the, the lines, the color underneath the, its, itself and decide by itself where it should go and what color it should do next, what kind of line it should do next. Um, one specificity of this robot is also that it's able to sign its own artwork, and it's able to decide when the artwork is complete, so when there's enough on the drawing and where, when the, the robot said uh, what he had to say. Yeah. <clears throat> is it okay to ask questions? Or you... Well, maybe it's better at the end, if okay. you don't mind. Sure. Um, <clears throat> So another, another uh, artwork that I would like to speak in, in terms of robotic art is Ken Rinaldo. Um, Ken Rinaldo work, so those are two of, uh, of his work that I personally uh, really, uh, really enjoy. So to feel this, which he, he basically made um, under-actuated robots that are uh, really used, or mechanisms that are really used for under-actuated ends and such, but he made them out of um, tree branches and natural um, elements so that the, the feeling you're, ha you're having when you're getting close to the robot isn't really uh, the same as if you were having an under actuated mechanical hand. It feels obviously more natural and it's react to the people surrounding the installation. An earlier work, uh, or more current uh, work, is uh, Tobias's microbiome in which um, the, the, big, um, the big installation there represent different weather conditions around the globe. And they look a little bit like microbes moving and uh, having their, uh, their uh, lightning system changing uh, toward the, uh, the environmental condition around the world. So uh, I guess you understand, and, and I'm quite sure it's nothing new to, uh, to quite a lot of you, that those approach and the result of it are quite different between uh, the two really small subset examples that I've chosen from the engineering perspective and uh, the artistic realm. So what I think, what I hope uh, we, we could achieve is to try to merge those, those two point of view, those two perceptions into, um, into project where it could fit together. So it's a little bit... Uh, um, like trying to uh, work all together in a flock toward uh, a, same, a same goal. Um, maybe a little bit to leap in the void uh, and, and, and try doing that. Um, is, it, is it really a void though? Uh, because if we're here today, it's because we already made quite a lot of steps toward the direction. There's already quite a lot of robotic art project and uh, some collaboration between engineers and artists that are going on. Um, one of the organizers of the event that uh, unfortunately was not able to, to attend, Demeterat, worked on one of these uh, a while back. I'll let him uh, explain it. 
So <clears throat> this was an awesome project between uh, renowned artists, as the video said, uh, Stellar, and a group at uh, Mark Story Laboratory in Sydney, where they, uh, they took the, the artwork of Stellar, the prosthetic head, and they put it into a, an articulated uh, robotic arm and they added to it an attention system, so with a bunch of sensors around to detect what the, the audience would like. Another project that I've been involved in since the last 10 years or so um, is an artist project with uh, Nicolas Reeves that is uh, with us today, uh, which is called uh, Aerostabile. So th this project is meant to have blimps, huge uh, robotic uh, lighter than air um, UAVs, that are able to interact with performers so that they would create an hybrid performance. So you're having uh, dancers or the singers that are controlling either by their movement or by their uh, singing the, the movement of the robots. The robots are fully autonomous on the stage and they're reacting to the performance of, uh, of the performers. We've did performance around the world with those, uh, each time developing a new kind of interaction new kind of sensing systems. It led to major publications in the, uh, the engineering field. And as I said, we did artistic performance uh, around the globe. So I think those two are great examples of collaboration between artists and, and engineers. And so after knowing about each other project, we just decided to merge them together. So we did a floating head project, which was basically just a single event uh, of one night where we used uh, all the attention system that marks the Terry Laboratory design, the avatar of Stellark, and we project that on one of the aerostable uh, blimp. And an audience was able to interact with the blimp while, while the blimp was moving around and trying to uh, grasp the attention of the audience and such. Uh, from that and a workshop that, um, that uh, William Smart uh, organized uh, back in 2011 or 2010, I don't remember, at HRI, We've started seeing different uh, robotic artwork around, and then decide to start uh, doing a book, editing a book about it. So, uh, together with Christian Cross from the Mark Auditory Laboratory and Stellart, they, uh, they they realized the project, and they put together a lot of, uh, of people into this book, so so that uh, artists could explain the, their artwork. Um, the book already has uh, more than uh, ten. Uh, uh, 10,000 um, downloads since uh, it, just in its first year of, uh, of being online. A great list of contributors. I guess you know uh, some of them uh, already, and uh, actually some of them obviously are in the room right now. And so all together, uh, we, we made the, this book uh, possible, and I think it's a unique uh, piece. Um, it, it was also followed by a couple of book launches, a couple of workshops, among which this one is. So in the line of uh, what we wanted to share with this book, um, in parallel of those workshops, there have been others uh, in other uh, in other conference, major conference at HRI also. And um, I've organized together with uh, Inside Lab also, a, in parallel, a couple of workshops uh, that will be discussed in the next talk uh, uh, with the misbehaving kit, also trying to look into um, the, the collaboration between engineer and artist into, uh, into um, a robotic project. Um, <clears throat> as I said, it was seen, this book was perceived as uh, the, 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 the artist explaining a little bit to the engineer or the scientist what their work is all about, and, um, and well, that was at least a general perception of it. Uh, in following into that, we decided to uh, put on online the roboticart.org um, platform, which document all of these workshops and more, so that people can have a follow-up on this book and on new kind of robotic artwork and on new ideas about those uh, collaboration. Which is why I ask uh, all of the, the speaker presenting today if I can record your speech so that we, uh, we put it online for people that are not able to attend today, but also for future uh, reference, just uh, as we did with uh, past workshops. So if I'm getting back to today's presentation, I'm going to be short about it. Uh, as you may already know, William Smart, uh, Demet Erad, and myself are the uh, organizer of this workshop. So Demet uh, was one of the editor of the book, and he organized uh, quite some of the previous workshop, and also uh, uh, Professor Smart also. Um, 
the, um, the little schedule we're having is, uh, well, most speakers had it already, so we're having a great uh, roster of speakers, as I said already, uh, lining up. This is the morning, and then, um, so we postponed the introduction, we postponed the, the start uh, from half an hour, but anyway, the coffee break is also postponed by half an hour, it seems. So uh, we're going to stick to this schedule, and uh, I'll, I'll see what uh, Florent maybe uh, we're going to present first in the afternoon instead. So, um, and this is the afternoon um, schedule. Um, there is a follow-up on the book also in terms of publication. So the MDPI Art Journal uh, asked us to make a special issue out of the, uh, the contribution of this workshop. Um, so what we want to do is a little bit of uh, balance with the book that was already written, Robot and Art, and uh, we want to uh, talk about collaboration paradigm and infrastructure, how we can realize collaboration between artists or the artistic realm and uh, robotics uh, engineering labs. Uh, maybe have dialogues between artists and engineers uh, toward the same uh, issue or same project. And uh, again, to do the balance from uh, how the first book was perceived, maybe to try to have engineers or scientists uh, explaining their perspective and sharing it to the artistic community as well as their perception. Uh, the call for paper should be uh, opening soon. Toward that, I would like us to think uh, about those little questions. It's just general guidelines uh, for the discussion of this afternoon. Um, and, but try to keep those in mind while you're listening at the, the other's uh, presentation through the day. So that's the end for me. Um, going to ask uh, Philip to set up his computer. Well, maybe I take uh, one question and, uh, and uh, introduce him.